Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm David, a bookseller at Literati Bookstore. We are pleased to welcome Eugene Martin at our At Home with Literati series in support of Pure Life. He'll be joined in conversation by journalist Stephen W. Beatty. And just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. The chat is closed, but you can keep that chat window open as I'll be dropping links to purchase the book from Literati throughout the event. The Q&A is accessible and please submit questions if you have them, it's much appreciated. Live transcription is available on your toolbar as well. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, the link to purchase the book will be in the description. Just a reminder, you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeastern Michigan, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, we'd like to thank you for your attendance this evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for being here. And now, allow me to introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Eugene Martin was born in Winnipeg, Manitoba to European parents, emigrated to the United States before the age of two and grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, where he now lives again after stints in Oregon, New York City, Costa Rica, where the germ for Pure Life originated, Texas, South Dakota, and Los Angeles. In 2014, an excerpt from his novel, Layman's Report, earned him an NEA fellowship. Stephen W. Beatty spent 12 and a half years as review editor at Quill and Choir, Canada's magazine of the publishing trade industry. His writing and criticism have appeared in The Globe and Mail, The Toronto Star, The Walrus, Canadian Notes and Queries, and elsewhere. He maintains the literary website, That Shakespearean Rag. I will hand it over to you and I'll be back for the Q&A. Thanks so much, David, and, and thank you and Literati Bookstore for uh, having me moderate this discussion with Eugene Martin. It is a great privilege and honor to be talking to you, Eugene. Um, I, you. you know, I've, I've, I've mentioned this to you before, but I think that Pure Life is a, a stunning piece of work. And uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to be able to, to have this opportunity to chat with you about it. You, I understand that you've got a reading prepared, but I, I thought we would do a little bit of background discussion about the book just so that our audience is sort of up to speed about you know what the book is about before we get into uh, to your reading so that you don't have to so that the setup you have to do is as minimal as possible um right. just briefly um for our audience members who may not have have read the book or are not familiar with it uh pure life is about a former pro football player um, who is known only as 19 in the novel his jersey number uh, who uh, has not quite made made it as far as he hoped he would go. He almost made it to the Super Bowl, but didn't actually get the ring. Twice, yeah. Uh, twice, <laughs> he, he almost made it to the Super Bowl, didn't actually get the ring. What he did get was a number of serious injuries and concussions that left him with various uh, after effects, um, both physical and emotional. And uh, as a result of that, he decides to take a trip to Honduras to procure an FDA non-approved treatment for um, neurological issues. Sort of a, a, a broad overview of at least the first half of the book, and it goes into some pretty dark places after that. Um, but I, I guess I wanted to start out, Eugene, um, by asking you about the character of 19, because he was a peripheral character in your earlier novel, Firework. Um, yeah. the, the protagonist of that <laughs> novel um, you know, was a, a football fan and had particular fanaticism for 19. Uh, and I wondered what it was that, that made you want to bring this character back and devote an entire book to him. Um, I think it was first uh, uh, having a setting, you know, a context first, which was Central America. Um, as was mentioned, I had uh, spent some time in, in Costa Rica and, and thought, you know, that was really uh, a terrific setting for something. I just, I didn't know what, you know, I didn't have uh, anyone to uh, inhabit it yet. So um, uh, sometime later, a few years later, uh, I came across, uh, I think, an article about, uh, um, you know, a number of uh, uh, football players who are really struggling in their post-career lives and, uh, you know, uh, suffering all kinds of decline, you know, financial, uh, social, physical, you know, neurological, obviously. And um, uh, that just struck a note with me. And, you know, I felt that um, I had someone now to, to place in that setting. Uh, I just, I wasn't sure what they were going to be doing, 
but I, I, I just had to get him there. So it was a case of, which, which often happens, a case of two ideas, you know, becoming one and um, like hopefully successfully, you know, fusing into a, a single story. Right. Is, is that how novels usually announce themselves to you via setting or do you start sometimes with character? Do you start with like a, an image or a plot point? A, a situation. I think. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably not so much setting. Um, yeah. Just a situation, preferably, you know, the, the more desperate, the better. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm drawn to the, you know, in over their head thing. Um, and, you know, and I, I think like people in, in like uh, a stage of their lives where it's going to be like harder and harder to recover from this, that, you uh, you know, uh, maybe as I, as I near that stage myself, you know, that's something uh, I find very compelling and, and really generates language for me. Right, right. Well, what was it specifically about Costa Rica that gave you the idea that this part of the world would be an interesting place to set a story? Um, you know, I don't know. I think it was just, uh, you know, for someone who had never been in that part of the world, it was um, it was uh, a, a bit of being in another planet. Um uh, also, we, we uh, you know, my wife and I had been living in New York for five years before this, and right. this is when the recession was hitting. And, uh, you know, uh, we lost jobs and we, we kind of fled the city because uh, we were living in Costa Rica under, under very uh, financially uh, easy terms, you know. Um, uh, so we were hoping possibly to come back and, and things would be better uh which which wasn't the case but right. um there i think it was just the, the jolt of displacement you know and and the language and uh you know the proverbial flora and fauna i mean there was something new on our doorstep every day as as far as uh you know the kind of uh wildlife you have there and right. then uh, right. then there are the people you know, the, the, the expatriates and, and the local people and this kind of interaction you see between them. Um, so I think that all just came together, but it wasn't, wasn't a, a, a real conscious thing. Right, it's just right. a sort of like a certainty that, uh, that struck me. Um, but I had to be patient with because those things can take a long time to gestate. So sure. sure. I mean, certainly when 19 goes to Honduras, he, you talk about characters getting in over their head, he gets in over his head very quickly mm -hmm. in a number of different ways. Um, yes. One of the things that interested me, I read an uh, interview that you gave to the Calgary Herald um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and one of the things you said was that with pure life, you, you knew there was a book here, but you also said you probably couldn't write it. And I was interested in why, why the hesitation? What, what made you sort of worry that you couldn't write the book that you were starting to conceive? Um, well, I think uh, that, that had to do with what you know, 19 uh, did for a living. Um, that just seemed like that would be a really hard world and experience to conjure up and to make convincing um, without resorting you know, to, uh, to sort of cursory, you know, almost cliche writing which right. you know of course I would try to avoid but um it just felt a bit impossible I, I didn't know how I was going to do it so uh you know I just did it the, the way I always do which is to start with really bad drafts and and um <laughs> and build on it you know I uh I, I definitely work in drafts and I never uh I use everything um even if it's uh just to, to end up discarding it sure um, but the way these different parts react to each other and and some things are just scaffolding you know um right and and it's uh you know it's just it's uh, writing a, a book is cultivating a process uh almost as much as it is actually having a book written are you a football fan yourself do you feel comfortable in that million uh yeah i am I, um you know with with what's going on now though um here i'm i'm, I'm uh pretty ambivalent about it. So, you know, I'm not sure what kind of fan I'm going to be from, from here on in. It would, in, you know, in a way it would be a, um, a relief to be rid of it because, <laughs> you know, I have like some not very good moments when, I, when I'm watching a game and things aren't going right. Or, or uh, um, I, I think it's kind of like, a, you know, James Dickey once said, uh, made a, a statement, uh, he said like, who of us does not want to be delivered of sex? 
And, you know, I would just change that to football. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it would really be a load off. What is it in particular that, uh, that is, is sort of making you nervous about the. Well, I, I think it's just, it's the, the life and death feeling that you have when you're watching thing. I, I, are you a fan or. I'm uh, not this? actually, I have to be honest. Okay. I don't even understand the rules all the time okay. <laughs> when, I, when I do watch it. I'm not even sure God what's going on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, um, yeah, there, there's, uh, I, I, I get think other, you know, fans of the game will, will know what I'm talking about, but there's just, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the feelings of frustration and despair and the things that will have you doing and, and yelling and, and kicking, <laughs> throwing, you know, it's, it's like, uh, I'm, I'm not proud of it, but um, there's something that comes to that territory that's, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's kind of borderline toxic, really. Uh, you know, do, you, um, do you think that football is a metaphor in any way for American culture writ large? Um, possibly. I don't. I don't know if. Uh, I think it's a form of conquest, uh, and and you know, I mean, if if uh, there are those that that call America, you know, sort of imperialist country, and and um, you know, here you can have all the uh, uh, all the benefits of, of warfare and. Um, you know, by proxy, right. you know, you, you can have death, you can have, uh, you know, humiliate the, the enemy, you, you know, you can, uh, I think it, it really is a, a feeling of, of, of messing with mortality in a lot of ways, just even the language of, of the game itself. I mean, sudden death, right. And, and right. Killing, you know, uh, a, a play, um, you know, in the clock, Right, right. The, the ticking of the clock. So it it is. It's maybe it's it, it's a little obvious, and I didn't try to play that up too much in the book. Um, I think it it spoke for itself, considering where the um, where the setting goes. But, right, uh, right. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, one of the things that, that interested me in the way you structure the book and the way you set the book up is that the first forty pages or so almost constitute a, sh a, a short story unto themselves because they're a, a, a kind of precy of um 19's career from you know his early days in school through high school college and then um, yes. on to the, the pros and this put me in mind of what Don DeLillo did at the beginning of Underworld but it also put me in mind of what you did um in the first section of your book Layman's Report which is about um it's a fictionalized account of Fred Luchter but the, but the first section there is also kind of a, a self-contained piece in and of itself yes. What what for you as a writer is the utility of opening a book that way? Um, in this case, I, I think um, I, I see the similarity you mentioned, but I think this was kind of more extreme um, evolution of that. It was, it's even more fragmented and there are bigger gaps between the fragments and, and right, missing things right. that, you know, you, sort of jolting as you jump from one part of his life to another. I think that was to... Um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, like like trying to, you know, render uh, a credible portrait of, of a professional athlete and in, in his career. And uh, that I thought was the, the uh, best way to do it was to through this kind of like compression and condensation. Right. And uh, in a way that I thought would stick and would sort of uh, permeate the rest of the, the, the story proper, which is in a, a more relaxed pace. And it's in. Right. You know uh, the that uh, um, prologue you mentioned. That's in the present tense, and and uh, the rest is in the past tense. And then it's it's reinforced here and there by um, with some flashbacks. But uh, right. I, I thought I had to create that world. Uh, and make it stick. And that was the best way to do it. Well, in the first 40 pages, as you mentioned, are very fragmentary. And I, I wonder if you you worry at all about dropping a reader into a situation where you're they've got an anonymous character who's known only by a number. Um, and, and in this very sort of staccato and elliptical style, um, do, do, you, do you have faith that readers will be able to follow you through that stuff to get to the the stuff that's more streamlined and more traditional. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, you know the, the the response that I've seen so far is that it worked. <laughs> and, uh, um, I would say it did. It okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I, there's definitely like I think momentum there, and 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 I think you know it's easy to to sort of rush along with it. Uh, it it's 
it's the kind of thing I would like to read. It was the kind of opening right, that right. would that would hold me, and so I sort of went with that. Um, right. And 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 uh, it, it's it's quite a ride. I, I think um, my uh, uh, whatever apprehension I had might have been kind of the other way. Like after that, when when uh, things slow down a bit, and uh, you know, um, will they stick with it then? Right. Or will it will will it be you know? Oh, the good parts are over. You know? <laughs> well, I mean, that, not... <laughs> sure, you know, sort of that those opening pages um, are very staccato and very um, almost machine gun like, but they do. I felt they kind of had, again, not being a football fan myself or an avid watcher myself, they had the rhythm of um, a kind of, of, you know, a a succession of football plays, Um, you know, so you, you've got that kind of staccato um, rhythm. The other thing that happens (laughs) as the novel goes on. And of course he, ages quite precipitously um yeah. and his his the the neurological issues that he has suffered in his football career start to um haunt him and, and start to get more pronounced and you can see that happening in the way the narrative also starts to break down in places and you know he forgets things or he leaves things out or he wonders you know um uh, you know what such and such a thing signifies and so on and so forth how did how do you if you're you know writing a book like this which is is in many ways um it's not a road novel but it does take him out of his um, environment and place him in an environment that is foreign both literally and metaphorically um did you have that structure in place when you started writing, did you know where you were going to go with this book? Or is that something that, that sort of developed organically as you were writing? Um, yeah, I did have a, a sort of journey in mind. Um, the fact that it, uh, uh, it, it almost from, you know, the, the, the end of that first section to the beginning, each, each section is almost a step in that journey. I, I didn't think it would be quite that, uh, uh, prolonged or continuous, you right, know, I thought right. there might be more, um, uh, stasis here or there. Um, right. and yeah, I think that just, uh, that's just sort of the way it happened, you know, Do which you, I actually I'll... tried to oh, go ahead. No, please. Okay. I, I did try to break that up. That was another reason for the, the, uh, the flashbacks, which are probably less expository than, uh, uh, there for, um, you know, pacing and for certain kind of ironic juxtapositions that I was going for. Well, one of the things I love about the book is there's very little that is, that is expository about it. I mean, most of the information that we get, we get out of dialogue or character interaction um, and so on and so forth, which, you know, I think is is fabulously rare in a lot of the fiction that I read <laughs> these you. days. I, I really appreciate it. Um, but but in, in terms of style, because this book is, is obviously the creation of a consummate stylist, um, where does that fit into your writing process? Do you find that your style evolves as you're going into a particular project or do you sort of see a character in your mind and think okay well this is the way I've got to structure this book this is the language I've got to use is it a, is it a conscious process or, or is it just something that sort of arises organically um I think it was it was uh fairly conscious I have you know, I, there are certain um, stories or fictions or novels that I find uh, prototypical and, you know, without, uh, you know, copying, but you're, you're, you know, I might tell myself, I'd like to go for that, that tone, that level of diction. Right. Um, uh, that, that particular voice, be it, you know, like what my editor calls close third, um, which is something I'm, I, I kind of stick to, uh, I will say that yeah, the, the voice is kind of everything, though, and I I, uh, I think I've, it's gotten more subtle over the years, but 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 still, I believe that um, you know that's what it comes down to. That there's there's no song if you can't sing for me, right. and uh, uh, you have to hear it before you see it. That's that's how I see it. Right, right. The, I, I had the opportunity recently to reread um, a distant episode the Paul Bowles story okay. about um, uh, American professor who goes to um, North Africa to, uh, he's a linguist and he goes to, um, to do a study of dialects in North Africa and bad things happen to him because he doesn't understand the culture. Right. Uh, 
I think I've I've read that story, and somebody does that has a, a really horrific ending. I think what it does, it's the whole story. Yeah, the whole story is horrific, and it put me okay. in mind of what happened with what happens to nineteen once he gets to Honduras. I want to be careful not to spoil too much about the the novel because there there is some pretty, you know terrifying stuff that happens in the, the second half of this book. Yes, um, yeah. But but I, I thought about the connection, not just with the professor in 19 and their experience, but I also uh, associated them because neither of them is given a proper name. <clears throat> and I understand that you are suspicious of characters' <laughs> names. And I was wondering if you could talk about why, first of all, if you could talk about why 19 is just known as 19 in the novel, um, as to giving him a proper name. <clears throat> I think uh, part of that might have to do with the origin of the character. Uh, uh, you know, he was, as you mentioned, a kind of marginal, just mentioned character in, in Firework and is only known by that, by uh, those numbers. Um, and, and it already because of that, it would have been very difficult to give him one, even though it's, it's you know, it's not meant to be a, a continuation of that book in any way. Right, uh, right. You know, you don't have to read Firework to, to, to you know, um, I, it, it doesn't work that way with me. But um, just those 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 words, number 19, number 19, to me, it has a kind of incantatory right. uh, sound to it. Uh, right. um, so there's that, but also, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's give, give him a name after that would have been just kind of absurd. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just, uh, I wouldn't have stuck. And, and I think like, names are um, inherently absurd anyway, to me, as far as uh, in <laughs> fiction, you know, right. and, and, you know, that's not, uh, I mean, the majority of, of writers use them. And, and, you know, there are plenty of books that I've read that, uh, that I love that characters have names with, and, and, and that's that. But I, I think, even in a lot of those books, you know, when I first encountered that character and, um, you know, hit, that name is a bit of a speed bump for me. And, and uh, I, you know, kind of, if it is a matter of suspension of disbelief, as you know, we were taught, um, I, I lose a bit of that. And right. then, then I'll, re I'll recover, but I don't think I ever, as a writer, I never quite forget. Right. And so um, when I was first started writing and, and wrote shorter things, uh, a lot of times I wouldn't bother with names because in short fiction, that's a much more common device. And, you know, and I thought sure. it was cool. And then uh, as I got into lo longer forms, you know, that sort of stuck with me. And, and, and I would kind of use that anonymous approach as a sort of placeholder, assuming later in later drafts, I would name people. And, right. and you know, once in a while I do, if it, if it's really just drops in my lap or is given to me, but, uh, uh, you know, for better or for worse, it's, it's, it's really stuck. Um, right. you know, and it, I always wonder though, well, what happens when you do this for the length of a novel, you know, is, <laughs> is it, is it really uh, a distancing device or is it in a way become, uh, more intimate without the obstacle of, a you know, those particular sounds, well, the other thing that, that I thought in terms of, and again, going back to Bowles' short story, uh, where the professor becomes kind of emblematic of a hubristic and rapacious American in this land that he knows nothing about and pays the price for it. I wonder if 19, by not being given a, a more specific identity in terms of his name, is sort of a stand-in for, you know, a, a, an archetypal America going into this Central American land? Um, sure. I, and I think uh, you can kind of have it both ways because of that, uh, the, the naming thing. Um, he, can, he can serve that, that purpose, but he can also, you know, be known more intimately as a person, you know, because we, we learn quite a bit about him. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's hard not to see him as, uh, in an archetypal way in, right. in, in, in certain instances. Um, right. and I, I, probably part of the reason he went there. Um, I just, I have to say though, it's, it's, you, you brought up this bull story and this is the second time someone has brought that particular story up, uh, in, in relation to my writing and in, in and and I remember uh, reading that story. The, the first time was Firework, where they equated, uh, you know, Jelonic's fate 
with uh, that of the the, the professor. Right, and right. and uh, it was funny because I read that story uh, when I was finished with Firework and immediately related to it that way. And then, uh, so, I don't know, I just think it's pretty cool to, uh, to have it, it, it rear its head again. Well, it's, it's weird, um, you know, some of the comparisons that I've read where your writing is concerned, like numerous people have compared your writing to Kafka, which is a comparison I just don't see. Uh, me neither. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not sure I get that. Other people have compared your work to Don DeLillo and Gordon Lish. Those comparisons I do see, and I wonder yeah. whether you're you're more sympathetic with with those comparisons. Well, yeah, there's there's uh, definitely an influence there, you know, in, in different ways. But uh, yeah, Kafka. I I don't. You know, I mean, all we have are, are translations, but right. uh, to me, he's just the consummate strangest writer and and you know you, you couldn't write like him if you tried you know i don't think anyone is a kafka writer um so i'm i, I think in in maybe in, in in a more general way but i'm not even sure what way that would be right right um, yeah. well i mean certainly where lish is concerned um you know i i see the influence of of you know his work with raymond carver in your ruthlessly paring down the language and stripping away everything extraneous and so on you've also been called a minimalist do you consider yourself a minimalist author um well there, you know there are, are are times when i can get kind of wordy i, I guess <laughs> but, uh, you know um uh but I think um, that that means, though, um, you know, because I think someone referred to McCarthy once as a, a maximalist. Yeah. And, you know, I could with his sense of detail and all that, I could see that. But he makes all his words count, you know, no matter, it's, you know, each each sound is essential. And I think that could also be a kind of, uh, you know, definition of that. Um, I, I do have some sympathy for that approach that that bear I, I i guess i am a less is more you know kind of person um usually so um i i would yeah i would kind of agree with that but with you know a, a kind of large grain of salt right right we've come to the halfway mark here do you think this might be an appropriate time for you to uh to read a bit from sure your life? sure um if uh, uh okay, here's a, a big shock i'm gonna wear glasses um, <laughs> okay and, and i probably have to hold a pen um let's see where okay this uh this section is when uh 19 is embarking on his uh his jungle sojourn in honduras uh he's hiking out of a uh, a remote village where um, a couple of uh, indigenous peoples live, uh, Mosquito and uh, the Pesh. And uh, he's in the company of, uh, well, he's on his way uh, into the jungle, but um, he's with a, a guide and an interpreter and uh, a, a Canadian tourist couple. And they're on their way to meet uh, a, uh, some polars who are going to take them upriver in canoes. Um, Excuse me. In the morning, after breakfast, the guide conducted a brief class in building a lean-to shelter out of bamboo and ferns. Then they walked out of town in rubber boots toward the forest and mountains, carrying backpacks and dry bags and bags and bottles of water. The Canadians wore wraparound hydration packs. The guide and interpreter had machetes. There was an occasional path. They passed the wooden schoolhouse where the bell they'd heard at breakfast was an old scuba tank struck with a pipe. Walked through pastures where the grass was sometimes submerged in clear flat pools. Stilt houses, widely spaced. Two pigs sharing a puddle. Brahmin cows with their long ears and baggy white skin, one of which had recently been slaughtered and skinned and its hide lay curing under the sun like a shiny red carpet. Dogs and chickens tentatively nosing its edges. The Canadians did not take this picture. They saw a girl pounding rice and singing, a washcloth on her head for the sun. She smiled, and the other villagers they passed always said buenas or hola. These were cannibals and pirates with good manners. And sometimes the guide stopped and engaged them in conversation. And sometimes the men spoke to her a certain way, called her Pantera, and she wouldn't answer. She had a way with silence. The children liked being photographed. A loose group of them, shirtless and too young for school, giggled from a porch with mahogany floorboards. 
The guide pointed and said two of them were mosquito princesses. They heard hammering. A new Moravian church was under construction, a long building with a raised stone foundation and many windows, Gothic arches cut into heavy wooden beams. Its long roof resembled the hull of a capsized ark, a vessel whose survivors would also be its congregation. The Canadian man who had built his own cabin watched two men on either end of a crosscut saw. These people are good carpenters. Like the savior, the interpreter said, every man is a carpenter who built his house. You couldn't tell if he was speaking generally. Beyond the churches stood a brown horse with red wounds gouged in its flank, which the guide attributed to vampire bats. Now they came to a steep hill with wooden steps embedded, and at the top was another store, small but well stocked. Behind it, an enormous black man was burning a pile of termite nests and yelled, Ketal, to the guide. While they spoke, 19 gratefully marked time with the others, sucking air and water. The smoke smelled almost like incense. The Pesh lived on the higher ground upriver. They were friendly and, 19 thought, better looking, but didn't want their pictures taken. Their dwellings sat on the ground and were not made of plank boards, but woven wood lattices filled in with yellowish mud, metal chimneys. Some had no walls at all, just thatched roofs or canopies on poles stretched over rude pallets or woven straw mattresses, and 19 wondered at how much can be done without. If it isn't a matter of getting, but getting rid of, if you are born to a burden and should live your life, leaving it behind, day by day, piece by piece. Sleep on the floor of the earth, pound rice and sing. Define poverty. Maybe he wasn't bankrupt enough. The visitors walked through a field of sugar cane and the guide hacked off lengths of the segmented shoots and told them the best way to eat it was from the side, less fibers to spit out. The Canadian wondered aloud if this wasn't stealing before he tried it. You can't steal from God, the interpreter translated, and it tasted like sweet tea. They passed an abandoned hut and then there were no more buildings. The polars were waiting for them on the high bank. There were five of them and the biggest seemed to be in charge, wore a machete and calf length cutoffs and a sleeveless button shirt. They were all young. One was very dark and was whittling at the end of an uprooted sapling with a pocket knife, shaping the tool of his trade. Another was eating a yellow skinned pink fruit from the tree he was leaning against, and the other two hung back. Greetings, introductions. Que pasa, pasa nada, but only the jefe shook hands. The guide said something to one of the men who stood off. He did not reply. She repeated herself, and so did he. The big one interceded at length. Lineman, 19 thought. He seemed to be explaining. It was not quite an argument, but the guide had folded her arms. The interpreter turned to the passengers. The one she talking to is called Irwin. He'd been doing this since seven years old. They looked down at the two papantes which had been dragged onto the riverbank. The other poles were in them. They looked back up in unison. Is there a problem? The Canadian wife asked. She doesn't know this man who doesn't talk. The jefe say the one who usually does is quit. The new man is Irwin's brother-in-law. He is a fisherman, but he wants to learn palanquero too. The new man spoke quietly now, looking at the ground. With his slight build and whiskers, he resembled the bowman of the boat that had brought him here, but no relation was mentioned. We have a student driver, the Canadian wife said. Is that a guava tree? We're still going, aren't we? Her husband said. Oh yes. She just wanted to let them know this is not regular, the interpreter said. He invited them to help themselves to the fruit of the tree before they left, but not the ones that had fallen. This wasn't stealing from God either. Thank you for, for that reading. You should point out uh, to, again, for people who haven't read the book, the reason that 19 goes to Honduras in the first place is um, to, to find this um, FDA not approved neurological treatment. He's, he's sort of a medical tourist. He yes. doesn't get that. And he ends up getting on this tour um, to, into the jungle because the people who run the tour want his want to use his name or his fame as sort of a marketing tool for this for this tour. So it's a very capitalist endeavor. And I wonder to what extent do you think that this kind of um, medical tourism or whatever it is that that 19 ends up doing, do you see this as kind of a modern day form of colonialism? Um, 
it it might be um there are uh I, th- I think mention is made that when uh, 19 is watching this, this promotional video for the clinic and uh, you know, you, you see a lot of locals and, and sort of, you know, average Honduran citizens being treated, you know, at this, uh, at this place, but the reality of it is quite different. You know, they're, they're um, seem to be mainly well-off um, uh, foreign visitors there. Right. So um to me, I, I didn't explore that a lot. I think it, it does kind of speak for itself as I, I kind of like to let things do. This is this is yet sure. another thing that's going on in this context. Sure. And um, uh, so there is, you know, we would like for him to succeed and be cured and all that. But uh, still, there's that there's a, you know, one thought you have about it. it's it's or, or the bit of cynicism about it, I think, uh, comes through um, in, in, in hopefully, though, a very understated way. Right, right. I mean, we'd like, yes, we'd like to see him, you know, him cure, be cured. And, and, you know, we'd like to see his life improve. At the same time, there are moments in the novel in which 19 is cast in very unsympathetic terms. And I'm thinking in particular of there's one scene in, in that early section, that, which you termed prologue, where um, his wife comes across him online um, being faithful to her, <laughs> which means he's, he's, he's online watching porn. And in the process of doing this, he discovers that his daughter is an actor in, in this, you know, this scenario, um, yes. which I can sort of foresee a lot of readers reacting badly to. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, you know, what, there's, there's this idea these days that a protagonist in a novel has to be either relatable or sympathetic or likable in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, I would guess that you don't take that approach. Um, but I wonder if, you know, are you concerned about readers losing reader sympathy by creating a character who is at, at, at least at certain moments in the novel quite dislikable? Um, I, I think if, if, if it's well-written enough, um, it, it can transcend that. Right. Um, you know, not necessarily that I'm, I'm placing style above other, uh, elements of, of writing because, you know, style isn't something separate from, uh, um, content to me, it's kind of synthesis of it, uh you know, the, 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 the wine in the bottle and, and, and so on. So uh, I, I think if, if the voice of it is true, though, they'll, they'll, they'll follow you. It, whenever I, I, I come across something that's sort of transgressive like that, though, and I think might push the envelope of sympathy a bit, then I just, I have to try it and, and, and see what happens. Right. Um, uh, you know, and there are, there are other examples, uh, you know, I think I, I mean, w- w- one of the the great books, you know, Madame Bovary. I mean, there there isn't a likable character in in the whole thing. Sure. You know, and uh, I I think what what is is worse than doing what I might do is is going out of your way and contriving things to to make a character likable. And and you can see when people are doing it, there are things you can plant. There are little you know uh, boxes you can tick off, and uh, yeah, that'll that'll you know that'll get me over right um, right um so and uh, among decent writers too yeah. well and i mean again cormac mccarthy is the same i mean you know he 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 has a lot of absolutely reprehensible characters in his books um but you know still a, a fabulous writer um you have sort of made a career out of pushing the envelope in terms of material um in terms you know uh, you, you you've had you know uh, whether it's jelinek in, in firework or you know the janitor in waste or or you know what have you um the other aspect of your work that that i find you know very refreshing is your frank take on violence um, your books are very violent and, 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 you know, the second half of pure life is no exception. What do you think the function of violence is in fiction and why do you use it? Uh, I don't know. To, to me, it's, it's, it's partly just the vicarious thing. Um, you know, I, I, 
I kind of, I won't say I enjoy reading, um, uh, you know, uh, situations that are uncomfortable or confrontational, uh, but it, it seems to gravitate in that it's sort of, I think the black hole that uh, for me, fiction revolves around. Uh, it, 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 you know, it's, it's certainly a, a part of, of, uh, of everything around us right now. And I think, uh, you know, it, it, it might sound a little bit, um, you know, Pat to say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to show it, it uh, the ugliness of it and, and uh, you know, the, the discomfiture of it just to prevent people from getting numb. Um, but I do think the, the way it's, it's, it, it's so readily available now, especially in these video clips that you can see of, of just the worst things you can imagine, which I, I can't even watch. Right. Um, I, you know, I, I just, I don't watch these things. Uh, I, I try to think, um, I'm trying to inject some element of honesty into it. Uh, you know, at the, at the same time showing it for what it is, but still making it readable. Right. Um, right. I mean, when, in this book, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me because even the title pure life is associated with violence because when that, those two words appear in the book, um, they're on a golf course in Florida and they're looking at an alligator and they're looking at the, 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 the um, armor of its, its back and, you know, it's, it's slitted eyes and, yeah. and, you know, the thought is that's pure life. So it, it, it almost seems as though violence is inex inextricable from any modern it, life. Yeah. I mean, yes. Like looking at the, the alligator, he's pure appetite, yeah. you know? Um, and, but that isn't really the only uh, um, connotation that those words have in the book. There are more, more positive ones. I will, you know, think the, the joy of, of uh, making the play in a sport, you know, that's probably a, a feeling of pure life there. Right. Um, right. And and uh, just the, the the primal uh, nature of the jungle itself. So, uh, but yes, there there's definitely uh, a scary side to it. You know, there has to be. Right, right. The the other aspect of of nineteen that that I found fascinating or intriguing is this idea of faded glory. Um, I, I kind of had Bruce Springsteen's glory days going through my head as I was mm -hmm. reading a lot of, of um, his, you know, his experience after he left the football field, after he, um, you know, yeah. uh, sort of returned to civilian life. Do you think that fame is sort of a double-edged sword in that way? And particularly the kind of fame that 19 had, um, where you almost make yeah. almost make it the way you want uh -huh. to but just drop just short and yeah. then spend the rest of your life having to look back on that failure do you, do you yeah. think that's, that's the you know part of what drives 19 you know to his alcoholism to his bankruptcy to you know well, sure. his marital problems and so on and so forth well, well i think yeah any any kind of uh positive attention you get is, is such a endorphin rush you know and at that level that uh it you know to, to be without it you know not only to be without it to be you know experiencing the exact opposite i mean right. it's it's it, it must be you know literally worse than death you know for right. some people so yeah yeah definitely and i think a, a case could be made that you know it, it might be better not to have it for some people um the other thing that that you know is inescapable where 19 is concerned is his masculinity and you have made a career out of writing about um the, the, the condition of postmodern masculinity. It's almost impossible these days to find a conversation about masculinity that doesn't include the word toxic. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I wonder if, you know, you have any thoughts or, or feelings about your treatment of masculinity in your novels and whether or not, you know, um, whether or not masculinity has been, uh, overly vilified in our culture or whether, you know, the, the, um, the complaints and critiques about postmodern masculinity are accurate? Um, well, I think, uh, you know, like anything there, there are just, you just, the viewpoints of that seem to go to polar opposites. Right. You know? um, 
and and I mean, I, the, I suppose there is such thing as uh, um, toxic masculinity, but there's also this, I, you know, if you go the other way, there's a kind of toxic opposition to it. I mean, like as if, uh, you know, biology can be totally ignored. Um, you know, I, and I feel that, uh, you, you know, the, the uh, you know, I've, I've my own views of it in the book, you know, I, I suppose I wasn't, I, I didn't have an agenda about it or, right. or it, it's just, it's a subject that I, I still think that there are, are things to say, uh, stories to be told, um, still to be given its due, um, without dismissing it as, as, as just a, an evil and, and, uh, there being no gray areas about it. Right. Um, I mean, there, there is a certain ugliness in some of the things that, uh, 19 does, but there's, there's that book, there is a sense of, of, of separation, I think, between, you know, what we think of as feminine and masculine, um, those, those, those characters and, and their embodiments are very far apart. There seems to be some kind of, uh, disconnect right. even within him. Um, I mean, there's this, uh, uh, it, I think it's, it's a, a bit of a, a uh, slight joke on that where he finds himself going into the uh ladies room on a couple of occasions right um and and uh you know some descriptions of his children or or, or the way he views women in sports or or uh taking on um what we think of as masculine roles um but it's i don't think it's done in the heavy-handed and you know fake compensatory way that we see in a lot of entertainment now. sure sure absolutely um, so that that is a thing, yes. Okay. I was going to ask another question, but I think David is here to uh, to well, move into the Q and A. We may. Um, I'm just. If anyone else has any questions, this is like your last opportunity to submit any. I'm going to let you guys keep conversing. If there are any questions, I will pop back in. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, being Canadian, the other um, the other thing I have to ask you about is the Canadians, the Canadian couple that that were a part of that reading that you gave, because I thought they were they were among the most delightful characters in the novel. Oh, good. I don't want anybody to be offended by that. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, no, there's no going offense or whatever. No. <laughs> yeah. um, but but could you could you talk about uh, where they came from and what what you what your purpose was in including them? Yeah. Um, it was. Uh, you know, well, it was kind of funny because when I first heard from uh, Jordan Ginsburg, my editor, uh, about that, I, you know, neglected to mention that I had Canadian characters in the book. And then later <laughs> on, I made a point of doing and then I, I, I wondered, he's probably just thinking I'm inserting Canadian content to, you know, make sure I get published. But um, those, uh, they're somewhat based on real people uh that we've met but part of that was uh you, you know when i was trying to put this this tour group together that was going to go on this uh this trip into the jungle uh it, it, it took various forms um it was it was much bigger and it was more international and then uh the, the canadians uh you, you know and the, the, this guy this kind of garrulous uh well-intentioned you know guy um and is his, I won't say long suffering wife, but his, um, you know, uh, wife who tends to humor him here and there. Uh, they just stepped in, in, into the forefront. I think it was partly the irony of, of uh, it's, it's technically an international group, but I mean, you really couldn't be more similar <laughs> than, you know, Canadians and Americans. And, and I, I just thought uh, uh, th that element just, just stuck with me. And, and uh, I, I, decided to limit the size of the group, you know, uh, which seemed to me just right. And right. so, you know, I, I eliminated the, the May, December lesbian couple, the Germans, and, and um, that's who just by process of elimination. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be how Canadians work their way into many things is just by process <laughs> yeah. of elimination. Right. Uh, you mentioned Jordan Ginsburg, who is an editor at uh, Strange Light in, uh, in uh, Penguin Random House, Canada. Uh, this is your first novel with a multinational publisher, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Does that, does that feel like a, a career marker for you? Yeah, it does. Um, I mean, you know, there there are, uh, without going into details, um, 
working with small presses has been it, it's been good and bad. It's been a bit of a, a mixed bag. Um, and, you know, but there are a lot of people doing great things out there. Um, sure. But uh, yeah, the 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 whole level of this team that you get like behind you, the level of, of professionalism, like, uh, you know, copy editors and proofreaders and, 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 uh, you know, as, as you just keep going through this, this refining process and, and, you know, the, the, the audio people, um, uh, you know, the, the marketing, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it was a quantum leap. I yeah. mean, Strange Light is still, it's an imprint. Yes. You know, and, um, uh, but um, I probably wouldn't have it in the way. I, I love the name of it. And I love, you know, the, the, uh, um, uh, the aesthetic of, right. of, of, of Strange Light. And, and you know, working with, with Jordan, that was just, uh, you know, I can't say enough about it or, or, or any of the people that I've worked with. And I, I, I seem to recall, and it may again have been in the um, the Calgary Herald piece that you were t- you were a little bit hesitant where Strange Light is concerned because it's a, a, an experimental imprint, and you don't feel that you write experimental fiction. I yeah, I didn't. I was wondering. Well, I mean, I, I wasn't trying to shoot myself in the foot, but I, I have to say, <laughs> I mean, I don't, you know, there are you know some things where I, I you know, might play with. Uh, um, you know, like sentences blending together or, or, you know, a little bit with topography or something, but not to, not what we think of as being experimental. For me, it might be experimental, which I, right. I think the term is kind of relative and subjective also, uh, you know, but, um, you know, Jordan says, well, well, what is experimental? You know, well, that's it. I mean, yeah, no, I'm not even sure what experimental writing is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, and I think in, in terms of, 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 of tone or point of view that it, it might well be thought of because you you uh, when you if you hear a synopsis of the story you, you might expect something different than uh uh what you get i, I think it, right. there are a lot of conventions that could have been followed going that way you know right. easily and and it, it doesn't so um i think it does fit you know um yeah i i, I love that it's a strange light book you know you uh you have had close calls with multinationals in the past, I understand, and, and without going into too many details. Um, it, it, the first case, um, there was a multinational that wanted to print, uh, to publish firework, I understand. Yeah, uh, and, there was, and, yeah. there was a case before that. Actually. There was a case before that. And, and but, but they demanded changes that you were unwilling to make. They, yeah, uh, we never got into details, but uh, um, there was some thought that in, uh, from, I think the, uh, soft cover editors that it just wasn't marketable. Right, right. And there, there, there was hinting around of that, um, which uh, I, had, I decided I wouldn't do that, but I never got the chance to anyway, but it just, they just decided to rescind the offer. Well, right. te- technically it wasn't, it was a tentative situation anyway. So. Right. Do, do you worry that, and obviously Strange Light is a different case, but do you worry that publishers these days are a little too um, nervous or hesitant um, to publish things that might, um, you know, rub readers the wrong way or that they don't feel that they can market in a broad sense? Um, possibly. Uh, you know, from all, all I know is, is what I read, the things that I see that are getting uh, reviewed. <clears throat> and... Um, uh, some of the the expectations that agents have nowadays too. Um, I, I, I it seems I, I don't know if that obtains on on your side of the border as much as it does here, but that's that's just a conjecture. Right. I don't know, right. but uh, I think I might have been lucky in really, uh, you know, falling in with with Strange Light as far as being able to get published. It, it might have been a tougher road had I. Uh, um, you know, submitted it. I did have an American publish interest, a publisher interested in a small press. But right. if I, you know, really uh, tried to get an agent and go that route, I don't, I don't know how that would have played out. Well, Strange Light is wonderful. I, I think because they do take such chances. Um, you know, with with the books that they publish, and you've talked in the past about your notion that writing a book, writing a novel, is like flogging a dead horse back to life. 
um, in the yes, sense right. that um, you're, you're dealing with a form that is essentially unchanged um, yes. since its um, since its inception. And the trick with each successive book is to make it new. Yeah. How do you go about making it new with each outing? <laughs> Write a lot of drafts in my space. <laughs> and, and, um, yeah. I, until that feeling of, uh, I don't know if you've ever been in the position if you drive like a standard transmission car that won't start and, and you, you have to get behind it, push it. Um, the thing with that is you don't have to jump the battery. If you push it a certain distance, it'll, it'll turn over and it'll right. run. And, and I, that's the, the feeling I have with a lot of, of fiction is that um, uh, you start out pushing it and, and forcing things uh, into existence. And then there, there uh, comes a time when uh, if you've done it right or, or persistently enough, when it takes off under its own power. Right. And that to me is that that feeling of, of aliveness. Right. You know, of, right. Um, kind of effortlessness, you know, in reading it. Fair enough. Fair enough. All Being right. Back. We are just about at the top of the hour. Okay. Um, Eugene and Stephen, thank you for joining us on At Home with Literati tonight. This was a very enlightening conversation. And thank you to our viewers as well. Make sure you buy the book. The link is in the chat on the event listing that brought you here. And of course, you can also come into our store. Thank you for your support. And we'll see you at the next event. Thanks. Thanks for thank having me. Thank you so me. much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stephen.